And with that, I would now like to formally begin today's conference and introduce Luke Hanna. Hello, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the sixth Annex 4 environmental webinar titled Marine Renewable Energy Test Centers in Environmental Effects Research. As Colin mentioned, my name is Luke Hanna. I'm a researcher with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's webinars and questions. Marine renewable energy test centers around the world have been successful in testing new technologies to ensure devices perform up to standards and are able to survive in the marine environment. Test centers have also provided researchers with the opportunity to begin observing how these technologies interact with the marine environment. Programs have been developed focusing on environmental monitoring technologies and methodologies, as well as interactions between technologies and specific marine animals. This webinar will discuss current environmental effects research efforts focused on marine renewable energy test centers and what is being planned for future test centers. Next slide. So there are numerous test centers operating around the world, as many of you probably know. This map highlights just a few here in North America as well as in Europe. Today's presentation will touch on PMEC, the Pacific Marine Energy Center located on the west coast of the U.S. in Oregon and is part of the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center. And we'll also discuss the European Marine Energy Center, or EMEC, located in the Orkney Islands in north of Scotland. Some other marine renewable energy test centers in North America and Europe I'd like to touch on is WET, or the Wave Energy Test Site, which is in the Hawaiian Islands on the far left of your screen. This site is off the Kaneohe, Kaneohe Marine Corps base in the island of Oahu. Um, this is a Hawaiian uh, National Marine Renewable Energy Center and U.S. Department of Energy project in support of the U.S. Navy. There are three bursts at 30, 60, and 80 meters of water, and they plan to be testing point absorbers and oscillating water columns. On the other side of the U.S., there's also the Southeast National Marine Renewable Energy Center, located in southern Florida. Uh, this site is focusing on testing ocean current technologies, and they will begin with limited ter uh, duration tests, eventually deploying technologies long term. Uh, over in the north of Spain, there's also BMEP, or the Biscay Marine Energy Platform. Next slide, please. So BMEP is an offshore infrastructure uh, for demonstration and testing of marine energy devices promoted by the Basque Energy Agency. BMEP is located close to the town of Arminsa, which is in the Basque country of northern Spain, and it consists of a 5.3 square kilometer site area between 50 and 90 meter depths, uh, where four static underwater cables have been installed. On land, BMEP also provides a research center in Arminsa where developers will be able to monitor the behavior and performance of these devices. Next slide. Another project worth calling out is the SOFIA project, which stands for Streamlining of Ocean Wave Farms Impact Assessment. This project is focused on collecting information and data on the environmental impact assessment activities being, being carried out at a variety of different marine renewable energy test research sites across Europe. Uh, they've developed a data management platform that has created, been created to provide access to information and data for many of these different test sites in research areas, such as the distance from shore, technologies being deployed, and different monitoring elements at each location. More information on the SOFIA project can be accessed from their website at sofia.eu. So with that, I think I would like to now introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, next slide, please. Dr. Sarah Hankel uh, is a benthic ecologist at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center and director of the environmental research at Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center at Oregon State University. Her interests broadly address potential effects of human activities, uh, including marine renewable energy installations, marine reserve designations, coastal development and bases, in, coastal development invasive species, and climate change, all on benthic organisms. She received her BS from College of William & Mary, her master's degree from California State University Fullerton, and her PhD from University of California, Santa Barbara. Before moving to Oregon State University, Sarah worked at the California o Ocean Science Trust, working on projects related to invasive species, oil platform decommissioning, and marine protected areas. Our second speaker will be Dr. Jennifer Norris. Jennifer is a research director at EMEC, she has varied, a varied scientific background and has been with EMAC since 2003. Jennifer has been responsible for developing the research team 
and strategy at EMEC and oversees all of the research projects undertaken in association with EMEC. She also oversees the EMEC consenting regime and works closely with government and Scottish and UK regulators on strategic developments in the licensing of wave and tidal devices at EMEC and in Scotland. Jennifer engages closely with the development of the new IEC certification scheme for renewables, the IECRE, and, in, and is one of the key players in the wave and tidal research field, representing EMEC on numerous national and international groups. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Hinkle. Thank you, Luke. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing at NIMRIC um, in support of permitting our um, future South Energy test site and um, what we've done with a little bit of testing that's happened at our North Energy test site and wrap things up talking about our future environmental research campaign. Next slide. Um, so maybe these animations are going to work, Colin. Can you click and see? There we go. So uh, you can just click through these, Colin, because we've already went over the different um, test centers around the U.S. and, of course, I'm from Oregon State University. Um, so we've got two uh, sections of the Pacific Marine Energy Center. You can move on, Colin. That's fine. So uh, we have what we call our North Energy Test Site. We refer to this as NET. And this is a non-grid connected site that we had permitted some years ago. Um, and the goal is to provide a standalone electrical loading and power conversion for a test WEC and to measure and record the power output of that WEC under test. And so what you can see in the cartoon, um, the small cylinder in the middle would be a test WEC. Uh, and then we have our Ocean Sentinel platform, which is um, what provides the loading and measures the power we transmit this data to shore. And so this is a square in the ocean that we have permitted to conduct these tests. We take the ocean sentinel out there when we have something under test and then bring it back in when a test a WEC is not being tested so that there's no um, permanent installation at this site in the ocean. Next slide. Uh, what we're proposing for what we'll call our south energy test site um, would be some permanent infrastructure where we would actually have a buried cable from shore uh, and berths offshore uh, more similar to the EMEC model. Um, and we are still in the permitting process for this site, uh, and so hopefully uh, this is what it will look like someday in the future uh, once we're through permitting and run cables and have multiple devices under test. Uh, you can see from the small inset map down in the corner that these two sites are relatively close to each other, um, just about five or six miles apart. Uh, Nets is closer to shore, about two miles from shore in state waters, and Sets is further offshore, uh, just outside the state waters line. Um, but they are both right outside of Newport. Next slide. Uh, so these are the um, sampling stations where a lot of activities that I'm going to talk about uh, occur. And the um, star that's up near the top is the actual uh, place that we would deploy the ocean sensor and the device under test for nets. The uh, larger offshore box that you see some potential cable lines running out of, um, somewhere in that box will be the future site of sets. You can click again, Colin, there you go, leaves that there. Um, but when, when I refer to nets and sets, uh, in terms of environmental surveys, uh, I am meaning all of these stations that are in the blue circle on the top. That's what I'll refer to as NETS. That's our environmental survey area, not just the tiny place where the Ocean Sentinel is deployed. And when I talk about sets, it will be all of those lower sampling stations, not just inside what will be the two square mile box um, that will be the installation uh, illustrated on the previous slide. So I just wanted to make that clear that our environmental surveys are much broader than the actual boundaries of the site. Okay, next slide. So I'm first going to talk about um, site characterization and baseline studies that we've been doing at both nets and sets. 
then um, touch on the little bit of monitoring we've done of what we've deployed at NEXT over the past few years, and then talk about what we anticipate Nimrit's future environmental research campaign, um, how that might shape up. Next slide. So um, you see the, the purpose of site characterization are baseline studies, so pre-installation studies, um, to have four main goals. So Colin, you can click through these. Um, first, we want to characterize the spatial and temporal variability in both the habitat characteristics and species distributions in the project areas. So before we can evaluate whether or not uh, some installation or some activity is having an effect on either the habitat or some sort of biological resource, we need to understand what is the range of what might be considered normal. And so we'd love to understand seasonal variability, interannual variability, and um, luckily over the past few years we've even been able to survey over this regime shift from uh, La Nina to El Nino conditions. So we can get a really good handle on what is the range of normal um, at these locations. And then the reason that we sample more broadly than just the square of the installation is to figure out you know, on this part of the coast what is the um, variability across space. Next bullet. Uh, we'd also look to maybe identify some species unknown to the area. So when we do our, um, all of our permitting paperwork, we make these lists of species we anticipate to be in the area based on the best available science. But it's also a good idea to go out there and uh, just make some observations and see if everybody you expect to be there is there and see if there's anyone you didn't expect to be there. Next bullet. Um, and so once we have a good understanding of the temporal and spatial variability in these resources that we care about, this can inform the design and implementation of pre-installation and post-installation surveys. With what uh, temporal frequency do we need to sample uh, to potentially catch what might be an installation effect um, in the context of normal variability? And what is the spatial intensity of sampling might we need to do? Next bullet. And of course, these uh, site characterization and baseline data will inform future monitoring results and adaptive management actions. Next slide. So uh, what we've been doing at Next and Set so far are um, characterizing these major habitat features and species. So we look at the sediment characteristics and the macrophyll invertebrates on the seafloor, uh, fish and epibenthic crustaceans, dungeness crabs, seabirds and marine mammals, ambient ocean noise, and what are the wave and current conditions. Next slide. Um, so this is at NET. So this is at our North Energy Test Site where we um, will deploy the Ocean Sentinel and a uh, scaled wet under test. You see we've been doing uh, surveys there for quite some time. We're in our sixth year of doing surveys. So again, getting a really good handle on the temporal variability. And what I've got coded here is the blue check marks are when um, we had the Ocean Sentinel and the Wave Energy Technology New Zealand WEC testing at NET. Um, it was just there for six short weeks. Um, and what that involved was two devices moored each uh, on three, a three-point mooring. So basically you've got six concrete anchors there. And that will come into play later when I talk about looking at um, some of the potential effects. And then the next summer, um, we, in 2013, we deployed just the Ocean Sentinel to do some of our own testing with it. Um, and we had that out, again, for about two months. And then we retrieved the Ocean Sentinel and left those three concrete anchors in there, uh, and so I've been conducting these surveys with these anchors in place and surface floats, uh, and that's just a very small amount of infrastructure in the water that we've been conducting surveys around. Uh, we've got we've got the cores, beam trawl, bird observations, marine mammal observations. Uh, we had a seafloor hydrophone, that's the acoustic lander. Uh, we did some surface uh, hydrophone surveys while we had devices in the water. You can see um, characterizing surface waves with a triaxis and characterizing bottom waves and currents with an AWAC. Next slide. 
And then uh, we've been conducting similar surveys for the past, um, we're in our third year at PMEX SETS. And so when we started the permitting process for SETS in 2013, we started conducting um, similar kinds of surveys. Uh, we've been pretty successful with everything except our um, seafloor hydrophone. We deployed two last year. One was recovered with heavy damage, and one was never recovered, um, but we put a new one out in uh, June, so we hope to get some uh, ambient ocean noise data from sets in the near future. Next slide. So just to give you a, a little peek more at what all those check marks mean, when we uh, sample the sediment in the macrofauna, we use a 0.1 meter squared box score, and we send the collection um, through one millimeter mesh sieve to collect all the organisms. We also take a um, sediment subsample for grain size and total organic carbon. And we can see if there are any um, grain size changes associated uh, with having devices anchors really in the, on the seafloor. Next slide. Um, so what you can see from this chart is uh, with five years of sampling that um, the sediment is pretty uh, stable, the sediment characteristics, so this is medium grain size. Um, the blue line is from our 30 meter sampling stations, and uh, you've got smaller medium grain size there, but very consistent. Uh, and then at 40 and 50 meters, um, the grain size is larger um, and pretty stable at 40 and slightly more variable at 50, but not significantly so. And um, when we deploy the ocean sentinel and potentially a WEC under test, uh, that is deployed around 45 or 46 meters. And so that's really great uh, for our sampling regime uh, because it falls right in between 40 and 50 where um, there's overlap in the grain sizes. And so if there were um, any differences around the anchors from either 40 meter stations or 50 meter stations, um, that become apparent pretty quickly. Next slide. And so the um, macrofaunal invertebrates, um, they actually have really strong spatial heterogeneity, but this has been extremely stable over time. Uh, and so all of the 30 meter stations have um, very similar communities there. Um, the southern 40 meter stations are um, similar to each other and fairly similar to 30. Um, then you can see this yellow um, diagonal lasso where the northern 40 meter stations are more similar to the southern 50 meter stations. And then the northern 50 meter stations are unique. Um, and this is uh, what you might consider a cumulative effects <laughs> kind of scenario where um, those Southern 40 meter stations are bracketing the dredge spoils, uh, dredge material disposal location from Yaquina Bay. And so they're getting periodically an influx of smaller grain size sediment from the bay, which is probably what makes them more similar to the 30 meter stations. Uh, and so when I get to talking about um, looking at detecting device effects, uh, I'll primarily talk to you about comparing the uh, net data to those northern stations, northern reference stations, um, because I wouldn't want to be trying to compare back effects to um, dredged spoils locations. Next slide. When we do um, the epifaunal or fish sampling, we use a two meter wide beam trawl, which we tow along the bottom. And occasionally, we have it outfitted with a camera, as you can see pictured here. Um, but primarily, what we get are um, flatfish. And um, we also look at mycid shrimp, crayon shrimp. We get crabs. We get um, sea slugs. And uh, some summers, we get gallons and gallons of pinafores, which is what you can see on the upper right. And um, those are pretty frustrating toes. <laughs> Next slide. And what we found with the fish is that um, kind of the opposite of what we found with the macrofauna. So the fish species are varying across seasons, but not spatially. So there's no um, 
depth variability and that's no different um, from the northern and the southern stations. So basically we've got um, a pretty strong summer cluster, sort of a fall transitionary cluster, and then a winter cluster when you do a community analysis. Next slide. Uh, we've been looking at Dungeness crab distributions uh, since we started sampling at SET, the South Energy Test Site. Uh, they are a very high value species here in Oregon, both ecologically, economically, culturally. Uh, and so people have raised concerns about them. So what we've been doing is looking at CPUE um, inside the SET area, uh, shallower than the SET area, and in locations north and south. Uh, and so if you click Colin, um, basically, what we found is the CPUE varies by depth, but not by transect. So we always get more crabs um, at our shallower stations than our deeper stations, and our deeper stations are within the set box. Um, but there's no difference uh, at the set location from reference areas north or south of there. So um, sets doesn't seem to be a particular hot spot or um, place where crabs avoid. Next slide. In terms of seabird or marine mammal observations, um, these are conducted in a variety of ways. So any time that we go out on a fox scoring, trawling, or crabbing cruise, we have um, marine mammal and seabird observers aboard. And then um, when other NOAA researchers go out using our vessel, um, those observers go along too. And so um, for this, this is basically confirming the species that we think are there, looking to make sure that um, we know all the species that are potentially in the project area, and trying to get a little bit of handle on season of, um, seasonality to see if there are uh, times of year that are better or perhaps um, we should avoid for certain construction activities. Um, and what you can see um, from the line chart is that different groups of birds um, do have different uh, times of year where they're most abundant. So the diving piscivores are most abundant in the spring, um, where the surface planktivores, um, there we see more of them in the summer months. In terms of the marine mammals, um, this really is a look-see effort. Uh, we really can't see enough to do any statistics on them. You can see. Um, that in three years of sampling, you know, we've seen 145 marine mammals total. Um, so the only thing that's even really worth making a chart about are harbor porpoise. And so that's something um, that potentially could be something that we would add um, to the research agenda that I'll talk about at the end, because um, that's something we really might be able to gather enough data on to ask interesting research questions. Next slide. Um, and finally, when I talk about acoustics, um, this is just a picture um, of the one of our uh, types of landers um, that we're not using anymore now that we've lost a couple of them. Um, but basically, you've got a frame, you've got some hydrophones, and then you've got a pop-up recovery system. And we leave these out from uh, three to five months, bring them back up, change the batteries, and put them back down um, to characterize the ambient ocean conditions. Next slide. And what we found um, from the 13-month deployment up at NET is that the dominant sounds are um, weather-related, so wind and waves, and ship noise. And what this um, spectrogram is showing you, uh, the top one, um, they're both the same time period. The bottom panel is just the, the bottom 200 hertz of the top panel um, zoomed in. And basically what it's showing you is um, that you can see the red and yellow intensities are um, when we get uh, winter storms and also um, in the last half of the panel from December to April is when we have the most ship traffic because that's our crabbing season. Um, and so on this, you can just see when the loud times are. Um, but Colin, if you click, if you zoom in really close, you can see um, the difference between what the anthropogenic sounds like ship noise, or click again, Colin, and that's what uh, marine mammal acoustic signature would look like. So when you zoom in on the uh, specific intense bands, then you can determine uh, what is making that noise. 
Next slide. So um, real quickly, I'm going to go through detecting device effects uh, because we've only had a few things in the water for very short periods of time. Um, so go ahead, Colin. Um, so do we detect acoustic effects? Uh, when we had the Red and V and Ocean Sentinel out in 2012, um, we were able uh, to detect some sound energy that appeared to be transmitted by the devices. However, in that deployment, um, the hydrophones we were using were actually attached to the boat. Uh, the boat was free drifting, but the hydrophones were attached to it. And so we could hear a lot of um, water slap on the hull of the vessel uh, and and noise from the boat itself, and so it was really hard to um, characterize anything about the sound that we might have gotten from those devices. Um, but although we couldn't characterize it very well, it still remained well below um, the NIMS threshold criteria of 120 decibels. Um, in 2013, when we had the Ocean Sentinel out by itself, uh, we allowed the hydrophones to completely freely drift, so let them go from the vessel, vessel just the way, hydrophones go by the installation, uh, and then we circle around and pick them up later. And we were able to um, detect the sounds of the mooring hardware, so chain noise, um, at five different spectral peaks. Um, but this was, again, still far, far below the NIMS special criteria. Next slide. In terms of the seafloor, uh, when the wet and V device was out there, we did one ROV survey, and you can see um, some scour around the at the bottom of the anchor. Um, from the picture in the lower right, you can see sediment uh, missing from below the anchor and some um, shell hash around the anchor. And in our box cores, uh, up until that point, we hadn't collected large amounts of broken shell. And so when we saw that, uh, that was pretty interesting to us. So next slide. In 2013, um, when we had the anchors out from the Ocean Sentinel, we started doing box scores um, as close as possible to the anchors. Now, this is something um, that's been a great opportunity where we brought the Ocean Sentinel in um, but left the anchors out. And so we can uh, approach the anchors very closely with our box score without worrying about getting caught up in mooring lines or electrical cables. So this is a really neat opportunity. Um, so what we do is uh, we use a range finder um, like you could use if you were out hunting uh, and uh, train it on that surface float which is connected to the anchor at the bottom to estimate our different distance away from the anchor. Now, it's not perfect because there's a walk circle, of course, for that buoy. We don't know exactly where we are in relation to the anchor. Um, but we take four grabs away um, around the anchor and then um, we take some going from the anchor east, which would be shoreward, which where we would expect um, maybe more effects, and then we take them from the offshore anchor going offshore where we might expect less effects. So next slide. And what you can see, um, so this is uh, a plot of the proportion of shell hash or gravel in the grabs, which is something um, we, like I said, typically see very little of, little, very little gravel, very little broken shells in our normal cores. Um, and it's a one year of data um, in the back of the chart is October 2013. That was our first sampling. Uh, so about two months after the anchors went in um, through October 2014. And with the purple bars in the back, um, the first time we went out, we didn't think about going offshore. We just sampled from the anchor inshore. Uh, you can see there was a huge amount of shell hash, uh, which was consistent with what we've seen on the ROV video, um, compared to what you would normally see um, at the reference station, so 30, 40, 50, and 60 meters. Um, and so that was shortly after the installation during a quiescent summer. Uh, and then we didn't go out over the winter. And when we came back in April of 2014, the proportion of shell hash had um, greatly decreased around the anchors, um, shoreward of the anchors, and then you can see OS West, which stands for Ocean, Ocean Sentinel Headed West. Um, there's very little shell hash, um, and it had decreased even 
again um, by June. And then it looks like similarly to the first year um, after the quiescent summer where we don't have a lot of wave activity, the shell hash started accumulating again um, around the anchors. And then we have very little data from October 2014 because that's when the ocean picked up again. And um, we just got out there and grabbed around from the anchor shoreward and uh, at our 40 meter reference station before we got our butt kicked and had to go back home. And, um, but there's very little shell hash that's accumulated, presumably because the ocean has um, stirred up quite a bit. And so you can see um, definitely some changes in the seafloor related to the anchors, probably seasonally influenced. Um, but what you don't see is changes to the actual grain size of the underlying sediment. So if we um, sieve out all of the gravel and chunks of shell and then analyze the sediment that remains, that grain size um, has not changed significantly. Next slide, Colin. So are there effects on organisms? Um, so this, there's a lot, a lot of points on this MDS plot. Um, but the take home message here is the, um, the yellow triangles that say they're from 45 meters, those are the box cores from around the anchors. Um, the um, green ones are the 30 meter stations, which are distinct, as I told you before. Um, the blue triangles are 40 meters, some of which um, are similar to 30 meter stations in the south, as I told you before, um, and some of which are more similar to 50 meter stations, which you can see more on the right hand side of the graph, overlapping with the blue 50 meter squares. And those, um, the macrofaunal organisms from around the anchors are just falling right in there at the um, interface of those 40 meter points and those 50 meter points. So while we are seeing some accumulation of gravel and shell hash around the anchors, it does not look like um, we're seeing any changes to the organisms that are living in that sediment. Next slide. Um, when we look at some of the epifaunal crustaceans, um, particularly I pulled out here the crinon shrimp, um, don't see any changes in their patterns of biomass associated with either installation. Um, I got highlighted in purple when uh, we had two devices in the water, the Ocean Sentinel and the WEC under test, and in orange where we had um, the Ocean Sentinel uh, and its anchors, and then subsequently um, the anchors only, and we don't see any significant variability uh, in the epifaunal crustaceans. Uh, so no changes there. Next slide. And in terms of fish, um, we've definitely seen over time um, some changes in the number of uh, flatfish that we've been catching. And um, these are at our reference stations. We don't take the trawl net. Uh, too close to the anchors. Um, and we have seen more flatfish um, in recent years than before, um, but we think that this is primarily related to the El Nino conditions we've been experiencing in 2013 and 2014, um, because you can see there was no change in benthic fish density during the um, wet NV deployment, and the recent increases started in April of 2013, uh, long before the Ocean Sentinel installation. Um, so we don't see any effects at least on um, the soft sediment fish community associated uh, with these devices being in the water. Next slide. Uh, can you click it one more time, Colin? Maybe my headache. There we go. Um, so basically, this is just sort of the um, information, site characterization, baseline uh, data that we've been collecting for these two sites. Um, once we get the site permitted, and once we actually get devices um, to test at these places, then we'll be able to look into some interesting research questions, actually um, coming up with hypotheses and testing them with a structure in the water. And so the way we see this playing out is that um, we'll work with the research agencies to determine what are the most interesting and important environmental research questions. Um, about marine renewables that we can address at PMEC, so in a place where you're going to have, um, you know, very slow phased installation, one to maybe four devices at a time, 
in order to develop a prioritized research agenda for NIMRIC, for um, the Renewable Energy Center here at OSU. And this is not necessarily something that um, will be conducted, carried out all by NIMRIC scientists, um, but we want to make sure that we've got a research agenda for PMAC so that if there are um, other scientists interested in conducting research at PMAC, that their activities align with these priority issues that NIMRIC has worked out with the agencies. Um, it'll enable us to communicate with DOE or other funding streams um, what are some of the priority research questions that maybe um, they'll include in future funding calls. And then as we um, get devices tested and conduct research, um, we'll evaluate this agenda periodically to see what goals are being met, um, what might no longer be a priority research question due to activities in other places like at WET or at EMEC. Um, and then what new topics should be added to the research agenda. Um, so we are really just in the phase of um, gathering information and we look forward to being able to conduct research uh, once we have devices to conduct research on. Um, so that concludes my part and I think we'll do questions at the end of everything, Luke. Looks as though we have a couple questions right now, so we can ask those, um, and then we can do kind of a longer question and answer session at the end of both presentations, if that works for you. Yeah, I can take some now. Okay. So are there any other devices planned to be tested um, at uh, the sites you mentioned in the near future, and will the sampling regime you discussed continue with the next device? I think you kind of touched on that, but... Um, so right now, um, there's nobody on deck, so to speak, to test. Um, NET is available if there are any developers out there who um, are looking for an opportunity for scale testing. We don't have anyone on the docket. Um, SET has not even yet been permitted. We're still in the permitting phases of that. Um, so it'll be quite some time um, as we go through the permitting process uh, and then lay the cable before we'll be um, open for business, so to speak, for developers to come. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then you also mentioned um, looking into future research questions once you get some other devices in the water. Are there any other um, research questions that you see at this point being particularly pertinent or of special interest of um, NIMRIC or other natural resource agencies? Well, there's... Um, you know, there's lots of questions out there. Um, you know, we've, one of the things that we've talked a lot about um, are, you know, what are maybe some of the, the nuances of the artificial reef effect? You know, we're pretty, pretty certain that these are going to be an artificial reef. Uh, you put structure in the water. Fish that are attracted to structure get attracted. Um, right. But, you know, there's an opportunity here for someone who, uh, you know, maybe has spent a lifetime looking at artificial reefs uh, to see, you know, what shapes of devices, um, what materials uh, could result in different kinds of attraction of different species. You know, what does it look like when um, you have phased installations where more structure is added over time? That's not typically been the way an artificial reef has been built. Um, so, you know, if, if there were a researcher um, who was very interested in the nuances of artificial reef building, um, this would, PMEC would be a really great place to conduct that kind of research. Definitely. Um, and then one more uh, that just came in. Is, is you know trends in benthic communities and fish you're sampling, how do you determine whether the change is beneficial or harmful? That's a really great question. Um, and, you know, that really depends on um, the magnitude, and it also depends on your perspective. You know, one of the um, right. one of the things we've talked about is uh, if you are a crab fisherman, um, uh, installation with a lot of structure that you can't drop crab pots in, um, regardless of what the perceived ecological effects might be, is going to be seen as negative. Uh, if you are um, a rockfish fisherman and this becomes an artificial reef and attracts rockfish uh, and you may not be able to go inside but you can fish the boundary like we see people do with marine reserves, this could be uh, a very positive 
change because now you've created um, a fishing opportunity for that sector. Uh, so it definitely depends on, um, you know, with what resource does your heart lie, I would say, whether or not it's a positive or negative effect. Right. Yeah, that is definitely a, uh, it's definitely an interesting question. And then um, finally, um, what level of change in benthic habitats and communities do you expect is needed to be able to relate those changes or not to the presence of a WEC? And um, what level of sampling effort do you think will be needed to follow those changes or one or more WECs are in the water, or after one or more WECs are in the water? Right. So that's one of our um, uh, Definitely a question that we're very interested, or I'm very interested in. I'm director of all the environmental research that happens at Limerick, but I am a benthic ecologist. Um, and so what's been really interesting um, with the anchor sampling that we've been doing so far, just around the anchors that are there, um, and again, it may be an artifact of not knowing exactly where you are in relation to the anchor, but um, sometimes it's our station that's 10 meters away from the anchor where we see the most shell hash. Um, and some of some times when we go out, it's our station 250 meters away that has the most shell hash. And our closer stations, um, we don't see any shell hash. Uh, and so that's been really interesting. You know, there's the bars I showed you were an average of all the stations. Um, but it's, it's been pretty variable each time we go out. Um, where, in relation to the anchor, do we see this accumulated shell hash? Um, now, the flip side of that is, although we've seen this accumulation of shell hash and a lot of variability in where or what time of year we see the most of it, um, we haven't seen the macrofaunal assemblages differ from the reference stations. So, you know, does that uh, accumulation of shell hash and its extreme variability make a difference to the organisms that are living there? And, you know, to date, we don't have evidence that we're seeing an effect. Um, now, when we get multiple devices, you know, and, and perhaps with um, overlapping spheres of influence, we might be able to detect some changes. Um, but I think uh, that is uh, from a, so my perspective would be from a monitoring situation, we're not seeing differences in the organism. And so we can say we're not seeing differences in the organism. Um, if you're looking for an interesting research question for a grad student to conduct their thesis on, um, you know, looking at really fine scale um, details about the macrofaunal assemblage and how those um, might relate um, to the distance from the anchors and the sediment characteristics. Now, that, that could be an interesting research question for someone to look into really closely. Definitely. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I'm not seeing, um, oh, one just came in. Um, what do you think is it an appropriate time to develop a confident baseline? Um, so I think, I think we have definitely done it um, with six years. I think that's probably more than you'd ever get um, a developer to do. Um, we've just had that opportunity. Um, only because we haven't had people testing it next. If we had developers testing it next, we would have only had three years of baseline because we would have had um, a lot more activity. Um, I think, you know, as a scientist, um, we've been told, you know, measure something, never measure something twice, right? Because you don't, you don't know um, which is the right answer. So right. you want to get three, so you've got an average. Um, so um, that would be my scientist perspective. I mean, if I were a developer, um, I might balk at that. Um, and so I'd say a minimum of two, uh, just so that you at least do have some handle on the variability. I think it would be risky to just do one year of baseline, um, because then you would have no idea of the variability. And if your installation showed differences from your one year of baseline, uh, you'd really have no idea whether that was an installation effect or you know, part of the natural variability of the system. Right. Okay, um, and then one last one, and then we'll move on to uh, Jennifer. Um, are people out there working on biofouling bio or biosecurity aspects of devices and moorings? Um, a little bit. So um, we've had 
I mean, OSU researchers, grad students have been engaged in um, looking at alternative methods of preventing biofouling. So, um, you know, preventing biofouling is its own large industry. Um, there's a lot of uh, ship manufacturers and um, biofouling paint right. companies who spend a lot of research and money on that. Um, so, uh, but we've been, OSU researchers have been looking at some novel ways of preventing biofouling using um, energy from the device to sort of put a charge across the surface. Um, so that's, you know, early phases kind of research question. Um, and then I've got a grad student will be looking to um, pull the ocean sentinel anchors later this summer. And so we'll be looking at, after two years, what's been growing on the anchors on the bottom versus what's been growing on the um, steel floats at the top. So um, sort of different places in the water column, different materials, um, you know, the different kinds of biofouling they're going to get there. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. I think we should probably move on um, to Jennifer's uh, presentation. Um, I did see one hand raised, so I think there are some other questions. If you do have other questions, please just hold them till after uh, Jennifer's presentation. Um, and with that, I'd like to in introduce uh, Jennifer Norris. Thank you very much. So um, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, it's going to be a rather different talk to, to Sarah's. Um, I try to condense um, really the, all the all the most uh, relevant points really into um, the sort of summaries of findings, approaches, and findings taken at EMEC. Um, so I'm going to be talking really about the the, the sort of main sensitivities, um, the environmental sensitivities that apply at EMEC, and some of the approaches that the developers. Uh, and EMEC um, have taken, some of the researchers have taken to try and address some of the regulatory queries. Um, so I wanted um, just to remind people of where we are. Um, we are um, in Orkney, as, uh, as was said at the beginning. We have our full-scale wave site off um, at Billia Crew Bay, which is, uh, experiences the full Atlantic fetch, um, and that has five um, cables, five grid-connected berths which are um, available for testing of wave devices. We've got at our Fall of Warness um, tidal site off of the northern isle of, of ED, we have our seven grid-connected cables up at our full-scale tidal site um, there. And we, in 2010, we developed two scale tidal, uh, wave, tidal and wave sites um, in more benign conditions. And these are not grid-connected sites, but they do provide um, mooring blocks for developers to come and attach to. And uh, in relation to one of the questions about reef effects and studying um, foundations, um, it's relevant to say that when we designed those, those mooring blocks, we did design them specifically with, with refuge areas in them so that they would be available for subsequent studies um, for uh, any artificial reef effects or for recruitment studies of lob. Um, and so those, those are um, available for either short-term or small-scale testing uh, of devices. Uh, we have one office which is in Stromness, and we are based right above uh, Harriet Watt, um, the ICIT, International Center for Island Technology. Uh, we also have uh, a number of units that we rent out to um, developers who all need space, of course, to work in. And we have a very, um, very supportive local council and harbors um, a department who have sort of moved with the times and built up peer um, services and facilities for the developers as they come along. Um, and there's a, an excellent supply chain uh, within Orkney, which was really one of the one of the factors taken into consideration in, in locating us here. So that's really um, all I'm going to say about EMEC uh, in general, because um, I think most people are, are aware that we're a test site. Um, the only other things I am going to say is, is to point out that I suppose a key difference really between ourselves and some of the other sites is that whilst we were um, we were developed with government funding um, initially back in 2002, um, we are actually a private uh, not-for-profit limited company, um, and as such, we have to raise specific project funding for all of the um, environmental monitoring that that uh, happens sites in a generic fashion. Um, 
and we, if you like, we're, we're between a rock and a hard place in, to some extent because we're not eligible for most of the academic funding, even though a lot of the issues that require addressing are academic, um, and nor are we um, uh, a developer ourselves with uh, investment uh, funding for development of, of devices. So we, we straddle that difficult area in, in the middle. And I have to say um, we have suffered from not being able to raise sufficient funding to, to make the best opportunity of, the, of what we have at the sites, but we've, we've done our best. So uh, what I wanted to talk about really now is um, addressing the main environmental risks that apply to, um, to the species at the sites that we operate at EMEC. This is not by any means an attempt to, um, to address the wider scale of devices that apply to the whole sector. We'd be here all night uh, and beyond probably if we were aiming to do that. So I've really centered on the, the issues that are of main concern for um, the regulators in providing licenses to the developers to deploy their devices at our sites. And there are really um, four, four main issues. Um, I have to say they largely apply to tidal devices, uh, although some of them apply uh, to both wave and tidal. So um, you'll see up, up there, if you like, um, I suppose issue of concern number one for tidal, which which is the issue of potential for collision between susceptible species and um, tidal devices. Um, that's probably an uh, issue of concern number one from our perspective, um, uh, partly in terms of the difficulties of gathering data, which I'll come on to later, um, but partly because of the, the um, state of development of the tidal sector at the moment and the fact that there are um, array sites being li uh, licensed at the moment for which monitoring is um, urgently needed. Um, the second issue is the potential for displacement um, of marine wildlife from habitual waters. Um, and that applies both to, to wave and tidal devices. And I'll be talking about um, uh, some of the projects that, that are in place um, later on. Uh, apologies for this. Um, the, animation on there, but I'll, I'll just go through them. So the potential for noise emissions um, from devices in operation, this is, um, to cause either harm or displacement of key species from their habitual waters um, is probably um, issue number two for us. Um, and again, both applies to both um, tidal devices uh, and uh, wave devices. Um, moving on then. Um, particularly our, our wave site, but also our tidal site, actually. They are, these are sites that were, were placed in, in fairly shallow waters, so they're both um, maximum depth 50 meters. Um, and they um, have been used in the past by uh, commercial fisheries. So our wave site has been used in the past by, by um, creelers, uh, crustacean fishermen. Uh, and the tidal site has been um, used by scallop divers. Uh, so these are, we, we've, in, in operating our sites, we have sought very specifically not to try and introduce them as closed areas or to get whatever levels of protection are possible to get them as closed and inaccessible areas. We've tried to, to, uh, to make a point, really, of ensuring the, um, the cooperative use of seas by all sea users um, as far as possible. And so uh, we do recognize that, that the fishermen um, did use to fish um, in the area that we currently use for our, our wave uh, site at Billy Crew. Uh, and we have put in place, we did finally manage to get some funding for a, a project that, um, that, that sought to have a, um, a dual socioeconomic and a scientific basis. I'll speak a little bit about that later on. Um, and navigation and safety, that's just up there to really make um, remind people that, that um, the issues of concern from a regulatory per, uh, point of view are not just the environmental risks. And there's a strong interplay between issues relating to navigational safety um, and some of the environmental uh, risks as well. But I shan't be talking any more about the navigational uh, issues. So really, that's to capture that um, the main sensitivities on our tidal site in relation to the concerns about potential for collision causing uh, that may cause damage um, really relate to the range of marine mammals and diving birds um, that frequent uh, our tidal site. Um, the issue of, dis of displacement, um, the, the approach that we've taken to data gathering there has 
has been um, one of gathering large data sets um, over the years since 2005 the initial project was established, uh, getting, uh, gathering 20 hours a week um, in four-hour watches of, of land-based observations using uh, binocular telescopes and recording all the surface visible um, sightings uh, to species level wherever possible. And so those, the two, the two um, grids shown to the left of the uh, stalwart observer there um, are uh, on the upper one is the grid that was developed for uh, recording all the sightings at our tidal site. And then when we developed um, the, the approach for the wave site, um, there was no um, end point against which to, to, to gauge the specific location. So it's much more difficult to develop a matrix approach. So we worked um, with some expert parties to develop a protocol that used a radial um, uh, recording approach where you basically uh, measure the, uh, record the angles of the sightings and work out the locations uh, of each sighting from, from there. So we've got large data sets that actually are currently the subject of, of um, a, a wide um, data analysis project that I'll talk again a little bit more. Uh, in a minute. So the, the other large concern, issue of, of, of significant concern is whether or not there's any potential for either displacement or physical harm to the hearing organs of sensitive um, fish and mammals. Uh, you'll see there the, the overlaps, the clear overlaps between the um, noises, uh, the anthropogenic um, caused noise uh, and the hearing ranges of fish and mammals. It's probably no, no news to, to any of you. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail. I, in my first version of this, uh, this presentation, which was rather longer, I did have slides relating to all the detailed um, um, monitoring that we've done, including background studies. But um, those are available uh, on our website um, for, um, for purposes of brevity. I, I removed them again from this one, but uh, I'm happy to take questions at the end. So basically just capturing that that, that is one of the issues of concern um, that relates to the devices deployed at the EMEX sites. Uh, and then again, the, the socioeconomic impact. Um, we really mustn't forget um, that, that range of impacts because as we see devices develop, and certainly as we see um, the licenses awarded now to the, the wider, larger commercial array sites, um, these issues are becoming um, very important indeed. So uh, bear, needing to bear in mind um, approaches taken to shipping and tourism and leisure, but of course um, primarily of concern are uh, any effects on um, reduction of areas available for commercial fisheries. And to, to, rate, to pick up on a point earlier, I mean such, um, such um, effects could in fact bring, be beneficial. And whenever we're talking about effects here, I think it's important to realize that, that um, effects could be beneficial uh, as well as negative. I think we can, we can tend to forget that sometimes. So again, the, the, the picture down below shows a, a lobster, fairly obviously, um, and um, uh, refers to a project that we, that we established with uh, working with the local fishermen to, um, to grow on a number of lobster uh, from, um, to a larger stage than normal um, in the hatchery, and then to tag them and get them released at our at um, so again, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, so those are the main issues that developers um, coming to EMEC who have to obtain licenses to deploy their devices, that they have to address those issues in their license applications uh, and they have to introduce mitigation, of course. Um, and I think uh, the reason why all of you will be listening is that you realize that it's very difficult to, um, to even properly and adequately assess the environmental risks when there's very little evidence base available to allow, um, to allow the, the risks to be properly assessed. So um, I, I've mentioned here in this slide um, clear methods that people, um, various people use to try and assess the potential risks using um, encounter eight models for, for potential collisions and a range of other models to, de to predict um, effects um, from a, on a range of other uh, issues, but basically the point I wanted to make uh, in this slide is that there is a, a, a dearth of, of evidence, there's a real lack of evidence, um, and we need to take all opportunities that we possibly can to, to gather evidence, to build up the evidence base that then developers can use 
um, in their risk assessments as they progress. Um, and the approach that's been taken here in Scotland, uh, again, probably no news to many of you, is uh, uh, that's been developed between Marine Scotland and Scottish Natural Heritage and has had uh, input from, from EMEC along the way, is to recognize that there is not uh, the necessary evidence base and to, uh, to introduce uh, what they call the plan, deploy, and monitor approach to licensing. So that recognizes that where there is no evidence base, then it is incumbent on the, the, the first stage developers to put in place um, monitoring that can be, they can work through in, a, in an adaptive fashion with a regulator to try and gather the information that's necessary. And that's where we come on to the problems, really, because data gathering um, by monitoring devices that are operating in situ under the water um, has a lot of different challenges. <coughs> And I've captured a f just a few of those challenges um, in, in uh, different categories here. So um, you need to bear in mind the conditions that are pertaining at the sites. So you're looking at gathering data from under the water um, in, uh, with limited daylight hours uh, in, in some seasons, with um, difficult weather conditions, which can make um, the deployment of data gathering equipment difficult. It can make the retrieval of data gathering equipment difficult. As Sarah mentioned, data gathering equipment can be lost on occasion. Um, there can be low light levels. Uh, you can get biofouling of um, lenses and other equipment that's, try that's uh, aiming at gathering data. Uh, and you, if you're dealing with um, monitoring in the tide, a tidal site, obviously you have, in our case, you have um, up to seven, eight knots um, tearing down the down the the, um, the test site, and that's quite a different um, resource uh, into which to try and, and place monitoring devices. So you have to bear in mind that anything that you that might have a surface presence, whether it be it a buoy or be it a data transmission, uh, be it a locational buoy or a data transmission buoy, um, everything will tend to get pulled down under the under the water um, during uh, as the tidal state varies. Uh, and thereby become a navigational hazard potentially. So a lot of practicality um, um, issues also related to the availability of vessels. So um, everything, every piece of data gathering equipment that needs to be deployed in the sea is going to be costly, very costly when you have to take into account contingency costs for um, um, for delayed activities and postponed activities that are suddenly called off due to weather changes, all these costs need to be need to be um, fed into um, uh, proposals for data gathering. And can that can actually, in our case, we've we've had a lot of experience of um, um, of proposals for data gathering that have that have initially been received with enthusiasm, but actually once the full cost. Um, are appreciated, they can, they can prove very difficult to fund. Um, so the deployment methods can be challenging. And again, that's where, um, where EMEC has a, a lot of experience in, in, in putting the equipment out and actually getting it to stay there and uh, retrieving it. Um, but it's, it's no simple matter. Um, and getting nighttime coverage, it's all very well, as I was saying, about getting the daylight um, species um, in information gathered from uh, using telescopes and binoculars, but gathering night nighttime data is equally important, um, uh, but equally challenging, even more challenging. So then some of the, to summarize some of the, the technical problems that we have to deal with is that, um, that some of them might even be disturbance caused by some of the sensors that are used um, to try and gather some of the data. So, for example, where um, people are trying to use active sonar devices to um, to gather data uh, in relation to the, the concerns about collision, um, there's a lot of concern about whether or not those sensors actually cause disturbance in their own right due to the frequencies that need to be used. Um, the availability of commercial off-the-shelf sensors. Um, there are sensors available, but they tend to have been um, produced for not for the purposes for which they are um, being used in these projects. Um, and they can often actually prove inadequate for the purposes um, that they're used for um, and end up being unable to provide the information that uh, everybody's hoping they can provide. 
Uh, we also need to think about the huge impact of the data retrieval uh, and storage costs. So how is data going to be retrieved? Um, if you're going to put a sensor out in the sea, um, are you going to put a, a massive battery pack along with it uh, and then go and retrieve it after uh, a couple of weeks? Or are you going to cable it, which has its own problems um, and challenges? And then once you've actually managed to get it back to the, to the office or whatever storage area, then um, especially if you're dealing with acoustic data, uh, you have masses of storage to deal with and uh, data interpretation um, to deal with. So even once you've got the data back, then actually interpreting the data to try and address some of these issues and provide answers um, is very, very challenging uh, in its own right. So here I wanted to, um, to just summarize really some of the approaches that have been taken by the various developers and um, some of the, the research that has gone on at the EMEX sites to try and address these issues. Um, the, the regulators in Scotland have, have, have not really had it, have not had, any best, have not had any best practice methods to call on really because it's too early uh, within the sector to have best practice methods developed. Um, and so the regulators uh, pretty much have to leave the developers to their own devices and, and the developers have to go away, scratch their heads and say, well, what data am I going to collect um, to try and inform on these, these issues of concern? So um, no surprise to see that people have um, tried deploying cameras and um, getting underwater video. And this, some of the challenges we've found there um, are the, basically the time taken to, to um, analyze 24-7 um, video coverage and also the, the getting the gathering of the data in the first place um, that has to be um, catered into the design and the cabling um, cabled back but the time taken to to analyze 24-7 uh, video is nominal uh, obviously um, the problem some of the problems that that have applied over the over the years to some of the camera deployments they tend to have been biofouled um, they tend to not not really um, be able to be used at long enough distances away from devices to provide any useful um, useful data. Um, some of the developers have looked at using strain gauges within the the tidal blades to try and detect um, collision events, um, which in in theory is a is a laudable approach. However, what we've seen where uh, from from those reports that have come back is that really the, the, um, the, the level of uh, information that you get back is, is not really the useful granularity. In, so uh, what would need to be done um, would be some automatic processing of the data to try and discern between um, uh, uh, the different types of signals that, um, that might be produced in the gauges that might indicate whether or not um, the impact had been caused by a hard body, a soft body, a large body, a small body, um, an animate body. Um, and indeed, even if you could discern those from one another, could you distinguish them from, um, from disturbances within the tidal flow, from turbulence within the water column? Um, so there's, there's not much evidence yet that, um, that using that approach has yet been able to provide any um, sensible, useful um, information in regard to the, in, the concerns about environmental risks, which is not the same as saying that, that they're not useful for other purposes, uh, condition monitoring, uh, detection of collision events, or other purposes. Um, some developers have looked at, uh, have deployed internal hydrophones to try and basically listen for any impact events. And again, similar problems. It, it's, uh, it's all very well um, identifying an impact event, but then when you have to attribute um, um, the, the event to a body of a certain kind, that's what you really need to do. Uh, and, and again, even if you can do that, then that's only the first stage in trying to decide whether or not that impact event had any effect on whatever it was that, that, that might have collided. So there have been other attempts to use um, um, active sonar um, to effectively visualize um, objects passing through the field of, of view um, in the vicinity of tidal turbines. And I think um, you'll, you'll probably be familiar with the, the Flowbeck uh, project. I think Beth is on the call. 
um, who might be able to answer questions later, uh, and also EMEC, um, we, at EMEC we have our own um, active sonar device that, that uh, we've actually um, deployed in the water, although we are still looking for funding to do a proper analysis. Um, but um, the, the point being that um, people are looking at using active sonar to um, almost to, to replace what the information, kind of information they would be able to get from cameras if cameras would work at the distances um, that, that are needed. Um, and I think what's become clear um, in respect of the, the issue of collision is that there really is a needed need for an integrated approach that, that perhaps uses multiple data sources. And it seems um, likely that there is going to be no one answer, um, no one kind of data stream that is going to provide the, the regulators the, um, the information that is really needed to address their concerns. So in terms of displacement then, um, as I mentioned, we ha we've had in place land-based visual observations. For, um, we've got long-term data sets. Um, the, um, the Fall of Warness data set um, was begun in 2005. And in 2010, we finally managed to get funding for the Billy Accru wave site um, project. And so ever since they, at the beginning of those, um, they've been funded. Uh, Marine Scotland have been very good at funding 20 hours a week of observations. Uh, and then last year, we managed to get funding for a project to analyze the full data sets, uh, which was great news. Uh, and that project is underway. We're doing work with um, CREAM, the Center um, of Research into Ecological and Environmental Modeling, uh, based in St. Andrews. Um, so we're doing a, a project that is due to end in 2015, looking at all the data that we've collected uh, and um, seeing if, if there's any evidence for any displacement having occurred and looking at predicting the likelihood of, of such dis displacement occurring um, in future. Now, I have to say all the data um, collected are available from the Marine Scotland website. Uh, and if anybody's after it and can't find it, then uh, do drop me. Um, so noise emissions then, um, back in um, probably 2005, um, I think um, some of the developers were looking at how they, would, they, how they would address these concerns about noise emissions from their devices. Um, and I think Sarah's touched on some of the issues that relate to um, gathering data from the marine environment. Um, you have to be very careful not to, not to be um, overpowered with, with flow, flow noise. So um, hanging a hydrophone off of the edge of a boat isn't really a very robust method. You tend to get uh, reflections from the boat itself, from the hull itself, which can vary depending on the material of the, of the hull. Um, the, the approach that we've taken is, uh, at EMEC is to develop um, drifters uh, that we deploy at the top of the, the, the tidal site. And we allow to drift down um, through the water column. So that's a hydrophone. Um, deployed within a drogue. Um, again, on our, on our website, um, we have the more, more photos of, of uh, all these uh, methods, which I haven't put on this, on this presentation really for, for brevity. But basically, uh, we've, uh, we got a couple of um, funding um, successes uh, to enable us to get some background data levels, uh, sound data levels recorded, uh, and those data are available. Um, but really, as we've progressed, then the developers, uh, the range of developers, have have, um, have taken their own, uh, have used the opportunities to develop their own um, methods um, of gathering data um, in order to to try and estimate um, the, to try and characterise the, the the sounds that their devices have produced. Um, what we have seen as we've um, we've worked with Marine Scotland to look at the outputs of, of those reports is that um, they tend to be, um, the lack, there's a lack of consistency, and they tend, some of them tend not to be, not to be so robust. Um, and there's a real need for more consistent studies uh, of devices in operation. So the learning, unfortunately, out of the sort of um, amount of uh, noise emission studies that have been done has basically been um, a recommendation that there should be more consistency used um, and better guidelines for doing that. And I know, uh, so we were involved in doing um, a piece of work with the UK regulators to, um, uh, and various um, acoustic experts to try and provide um, 
a guidance document um, for regulators and for developers on what to look for and what to do uh, in your acoustic studies. And those are available, um, that's available from our website as well. Um, but really wanted to highlight there the difficulty when there are no best practice methods, the difficulty that developers find themselves in. Um, and to reiterate really to other test sites that are developing um, at the moment, uh, the need for um, good funding to be in place right at the outset to enable these things to be done well uh, from, from the outset. And then uh, the final one is the infor inshore fisheries. Uh, we put in place the lobster study, uh, which we worked up with the, with the fishermen, uh, aiming to work with the fishermen in gathering the data. Um, we did see um, tagged juveniles uh, deployed, uh, released at, at our wave site. Uh, we worked very in close in close liaison with, um, we subcontracted ICIT, in fact, uh, Harriet Watt, to do that study with us. Um, and we work closely with the fishermen. And the, um, the local fishing society has managed to get funding to continue that study, uh, which is excellent news. So the, the point of this slide is, um, is to show really what I've touched on um, so far which is the, the, the vehicle that we have at EMEC for looking at the efficiency, the efficacy, um, and success of any and all of the, um, the data gathering and the environmental monitoring that's been undertaken at the uh, EMEC um, sites. So this group, um, the EMEC Monitoring Advisory Group, is one that has uh, formed many years ago, which sees us liaising very closely with the uh, regulators in Scotland um, and all their, their environmental uh, advisors, uh, particularly Scottish Natural, Her Natural Heritage and the Sea Mammal Research Unit. Looking, we've looked throughout at addressing uncertainties uh, from the regulatory process because the onus has been on um, really enabling devices to become licensed and get in the water. That's been the focus throughout. Uh, whilst we recognize there are very, very many interesting research issues that can be addressed, our primary focus has been enabling the licensing. Um, so we've been looking at what monitoring could be undertaken generically then at EMEC and what could be learned from what's been done. So uh, the pound sign is there for a, for a very good reason, uh, again, as a reminder to people to, to adequately resource their, their uh, research and monitoring programs. Um, it's very, very frustrating to try and develop a, a program as we've done at EMEC which has had no funding from the outset and has to be a funded piecemeal um, in, a, in a very limited um, funding scenario. Um, and so then uh, the opportunity we really did take was to review all the developers' projects um, as they'd come in, um, looking at which methods used and which didn't, um, as I've talked It also allowed us to review all the other research that's been undertaken. And so we, we had... Um, um, we've looked for the, the learning effect, effectively that can be gained, has been gained from some of the, the projects that you'll have heard of, the Flowback project, the response project, um, that you can um, look up on uh, the different websites to see the findings of. Um, and also then looking at um, gaps that we have for the future, uh, for future monitoring that will benefit the industry as a whole. Uh, whilst enabling, continuing to enable um, more eased regulation. And it's, uh, I suppose, overall, the overall finding, which is not what everyone wants to hear, but it's honest, is that current methods that are being used, they do provide some evidence um, that's needed. Um, so we are seeing some, um, some very good work coming out of the analysis um, in the Flowback project. Uh, again, have a look at that website, um, looking at using the, the EK60 uh, fish finder as the active sonar and doing some other very good studies with radar. Um, so there are pockets of, of um, success coming out, but from what the developers have actually been able to use themselves in terms of the off-the-shelf sensors that are, that are available, there's recognition that the sensors are not really good enough, um, but do show some potential for improvement. So really the approach that we took uh, back in 2010 um, with the re a project called the REDAPT project, which was funded by um, the Energy Technologies Institute, was um, 
to recognize that, that an integrated approach was almost certainly needed to data gathering and that no, no one main um, data set was, was likely to, to give all the, the, the to address all the issues of concern. Um, we recognized um, the, the, the main environmental concerns are as stated. Um, and the, again, the main challenge here was um, to gather data from what is a very complex environment indeed, um, where really the data sets that you need to gather are so long um, to have prolonged data sets gathered in the vicinity of, of devices um, requires either massive battery uh, packs or cabling, and so we took the opportunity to develop a, a cable system. And um, the next slide shows the overall approach that we've taken. So we um, we, we built, I suppose this was a, a precursor, I suppose, to the, the Flowbeck pod and other pods that have developed since. Um, so we've built a, um, a multi-sensor a seabed pod which has uh, active sonar, it has a current profiler, it has two hydrophones pointing in different directions actually, That's a, they're shown in pointing in the same direction for graphic simplicity there, uh, and a CTDU um, unit there. Um, that's the actual pod as it was deployed um, in 2012. Um, I, would, I would just add that after it was deployed and commissioned and all the data uh, was successfully retrieved from it, um, we had a problem with one of the connectors um, and the, the, uh, to the power unit, and unfortunately we had a corrosion pathway set up, so we had to retrieve the unit, uh, and then the funding ran out for that project. So we then spent another six to nine months raising further funding to get it further developed, which we've now successfully done, thanks to the Scottish Government, the Carbon Trust, um, and we have um, created a more flexible unit which will allow us to swap out the sensors uh, so we can put on a different active sonar device. We could swap out the, the, um, the hydrophones and we could put other, other sensors on as well. Um, it is a cable system, so it is much more expensive to deploy than, um, than a, a non-cabled system, clearly. Um, but it is in the water um, as I speak. It's gathering data from the hydrophones, the active sonar, the ADCP. Um, and it's um, incredibly frustrating for me to have to uh, admit this, but um, one of the things that we have still not been able to raise funding for is the development of a properly integrated data analysis um, approach which, um, which funds the, the vast amount of data analysis that's needed. That's something we're working on right at the moment, and we hope to get some success. Um, so uh, in a little bit more detail, just coming towards the, the end now, um, so that's the, that's the unit. When it was deployed, first of all, it was deployed 100 meters away from the, um, the, the, tu the turbine. So here's the pod. Uh, I don't know if you can see the cursor on the screen. Um, it's 100 meters away from um, the turbine. Um, and it ping the, pinging, the vertical pinging is the, uh, the ADCP. Uh, measuring the, the current, um, the blue, um, the blue is the uh, the active sonar. Then remembering we've got hydrophones on the device uh, recording um, all the noise um, from multiple um, sources. Whilst the hydrophones are actually aimed at um, recording device noise, um, the initial uh, commissioning uh, data analysis, the data analysis of the, the commissioning data did actually pick up what seemed to be evidence of uh, cetacean presence, which, which is interesting. So in coordination then, um, we also have the separate, completely independently funded, independent wildlife observations uh, that we would ideally like to integrate to be able to look at, um, look at that data source, um, identify when there are target species in the area, and then to then to put in place triggers that um, that would set the other the active sonar and the camera off. Again, that um, that has to be developed first. Um, we all also mentioned briefly earlier the marine radar uh, that's up there. Some very good work being done by the National Oceanographic Centre um, as part of the Flowbeck project and elsewhere, looking at um, characterising um, the tidal resource and indeed turbulence that might be caused by tidal turbines um, as evidence through um, surface um, 
as surface evident um, through uh, picked up just by normal marine radar. Uh, and there's some very interesting work, again, coming off of, uh, out from the Flowbeck project on using radar um, to uh, detect even flocks of birds and um, fins of uh, some cetaceans. So uh, I'd encourage people to have a look at, uh, at that. Um, and also we, um, we uh, ran our uh, drifting acoustic buoys periodically down through the site to get some drifting acoustic data at the same time as, as all the rest. Uh, so we've got multiple sources of data um, with the, the camera in, in this, um, in the initial deployment, uh, the camera was actually mounted on the, the turbine, but in our um, more, uh, in better improved pod, we actually have the, the video camera the, um, the pod the itself. So again, as I said, that's, um, the data are all coming in, um, the, the project is uh, it does not, unfortunately, doesn't include um, much funding for data analysis, so that is something that we're looking for at the moment. So really, in, as, a, as a quick summary, uh, the evidence base uh, is still urgently needed to aid regulatory decision making, um, despite a lot of years trying to use a lot of different sensors. Um, the monitoring of devices in situ under the water is fraught with difficulties. Um, data analysis really ideally needs to be automated and integrated. Um, automation is a real problem. It's a, it's a very significant issue. Um, algorithms, behavioral algorithms need to be developed to make it, uh, it really useful. Um, and even, even if you can get that sorted, you've still got massive problems of data volume, especially when dealing with uh, acoustic data. Um, and looking at fully integrated uh, data analysis is is a very complex and costly issue. And just a note, very finally, the last thing I wanted to say was um, that the, the, we were, we're planning to um, you know, disseminate the overall findings um, from the EMEC MAD uh, later this year. Um, but uh, we've, as I've explained, uh, there are bits of evidence, uh, bits of useful information coming off. Um, but I wouldn't want anyone to be disappointed by thinking that we've learned actually an awful lot, an awful lot more than we actually have. The challenges are still there. Data collection is still um, a massive problem, and sensors um, need further development. So that's me. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That was a very, very good presentation. Um, so it looks like we're about to run out of time, but we do have some questions. Um, and so we'll take a couple questions to, to wrap it up. Um, so the issue of a potential collision of animals with turbines continues to be very challenging to investigate. Have you thought about any novel approaches uh, at, or I'm sorry, this is the wrong question. Let me see here. Um, the, the issue of potential collision of animals with turbines continues to be very challenging to investigate. And EMEC has made an excellent contribution to the state of the science. What pathway do you see for moving forward towards almost, I guess you could say, retiring this particular risk? Looking at retiring the risk, did you say? Yeah, yeah, better, yeah. you know, better yeah. understanding. The... Well, um, <laughs> I actually have a lot of hopes for underwater cameras myself. Uh, I think there are a lot of... Um, improvements being made to cameras. Um, the challenge, um, and there are, um, there's good software being developed at the moment for some of the, the, um, the better enabled cameras. Uh, the challenge is still going to be uh, being able to get um, good enough visibility from far enough away, um, and, and also getting any coverage during the night, during the hours of darkness. So I have to say, even though um, using active sonar um, does see, is fraught with many difficulties. Um, I still have a lot of hopes pinned on um, some of the, the, the monitoring that's been done at the MAGEN site. So in case anybody is not, not aware of uh, the, the MAGEN project, so that's the, that's the first commercial project that's been uh, licensed uh, in Scotland. Do have a look at MAGEN, that's M-E-Y-G-E-N. Uh, the Scottish Government is funding um, some of the uh, what it considers to be essential uh, monitoring associated with the regulation. Um, and they are looking at 
um, different ways of gathering the device, the, the, the specific information needed using a mixture of active sonar, um, and passive sonar, and, and camera information. Uh, I think they are probably planning to use the Flowbeck pod, so do have a look at that um, at that website. Um, but we're we're hoping to get. I mean, I think that there are a lot of hopes being pinned on that monitoring program, which will be um, be, be producing useful information in uh, when when the devices are deployed in the water. Um, separately, uh, if we're looking at that's, I suppose you could say there might be a distinction between how you monitor surface um, seabed mounted devices, so devices that basically sit on the seabed, um, compared to maybe floating devices. Uh, and we've got uh, a project we're actually working on developing a proposal at the moment uh, aimed at monitoring the surface devices, this is devices that are, so tidal devices whose support structures are actually floating and then the turbines hang down below, below the floating structure. But as for retiring the issue, um, I think the aim has been all along to try and gather information at the first, the early stage deployment sites, um, really to inform the level of the risk. Um, and still, that still hasn't produced the necessary evidence base. So for the, for the wee while yet, I'm afraid, I don't think it's going to be able to be retired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, great. Um, and to, to analyze displacement, have you ever performed any tagging studies with fish or marine mammals, or is it all uh, visual observation? At our sites, we've just done the visual observations. We've looked at the feasibility and the potential usefulness of doing tagging studies. In the past, we've had a, a lot of discussions with the SMRU, Sea Mammal Research Unit, and our monitoring advisory group looking at whether the, we would get any useful information from tagging. Um, we have, similar to Sarah, we have relatively low, num low numbers of cetaceans um, at EMEC. Um, and so tagging studies have been um, deemed by the experts to be of limited use at our sites. Um, personally, I think it would have been nice to have done some tagging studies. But again, whether or not we'd have had sufficient uh, animals to, to give really useful data, then um, yeah, it would remain to be seen. OK. Uh, and one, one last question. Uh, have, have you had any significant opposition to your EMAC activities? No. <laughs> we have, yeah. we have um, depends what you mean by significant opposition. I mean, bearing in mind that EMAC, the EMEC sites are fairly small sites. They're well-defined sites. Um, the only amount of, um, I won't even say opposition, possibly antagonism that we've, might have, we've experienced over the years was really after the Crown Estate um, released um, a large number of test areas all up the coastline, um, mm -hmm. which were seen, um, they gave the, it gave the impression that the whole of the west coast of Orkney mainland would be inaccessible to inshore fisheries. Um, that understandably caused um, objection from the, the fishermen. Um, but at, at EMEC, we've placed a lot of importance on engaging very closely with all the stakeholders. And we've spent a lot of um, time and effort doing that, making sure that people know uh, what's coming along and that we take into account people's views, be they fishermen or the local ferry company or Orkney Harbors or, or RSPB, et cetera. So um, I think from a test site perspective, the, the, the essential lesson there is really you know, to, to make sure that you have really good stakeholder engagement and you don't just make that tokenistic saying to you and you try and address the issues that they're raising. So mm -hmm. no, we haven't had real objections, no. Yeah, and that makes sense considering your success over the many years. OK, great. Well, um, I'm not seeing any other questions. And we've gone a bit over time. But um, I'd like to give a special thank you to our presenters. Um, for presenting today on this very interesting uh, topic. And also like to thank uh, the participants for participating in today's webinar. Um, just as a reminder, a recording of today's presentation as well as uh, copies of the presentations will be posted on TTHIS. Um, and the URL is right there. Uh, this, the website also has information on previous and upcoming uh, Annex 4 workshops and conference or um, webinars. 
The next Annex for Environmental Webinar is currently being discussed for the topic. Uh, if you have any suggestions or ideas, uh, please send them our way. And then for those of you who are not on the webinar mailing list, um, if you'd like to be, simply send an email to uh, that email address right there and you'll be placed on there. Um, so again, I'd like to thank the presenters and thank you all. And